Go Inside the Crimson Tide, Tider Insider TV with Rodney Orr and Gary Harris. You know, we try to get these guys not to play basketball, but they all think they can play in the NBA, so I guess they just got to suffer the consequences. Nick Saban not 100% uh, pleased with running back Blake Sims after the Crimson Tide football player suffered a minor injury playing basketball over spring break. Other than that, though, it looks like Bama came back from the off week in A-OK -okay shape. Good evening, everybody, and welcome in to Tider Insider Television presented by Buffalo Rock tonight. Ice cold Pepsi Cola. You already tasted it. Was it as cold it's as I cold. think it is? It's cold. I can stick it in the freezer just for you. Yeah. Those little ice I appreciate crystals. that. You love it. Well, Alongside Rodney Orr from TiderInsider.com, I'm Gary Harris. You were going to say? I'm glad you think of me. I, I do. I do. Got to keep you happy. You're the, you're the man in black like Johnny Cash. I am. I don't want to upset you. <laughs> Bama came back from spring break ready to go. Practice resumed for the Crimson Tide on Monday. And Rod, I got to tell you that uh, the thing that I was out there yesterday, the thing that was obvious to me about this team is this is now the sixth spring practice for Nick Saban at Alabama. And these players have all been through the program. Even the redshirt freshmen know what to expect. And even the guys who enrolled in, in January, you know, learning from the older players. So this is a veteran football program that's won a lot of games, and these guys know what's expected of them. You see it, he lets you out there in the booth, but out there with his team. Let me ask you this, Greg. How good is it? to have a team coming back where you have the Outland Trophy winner, Barrett Jones, you have Chance Warmack, who's going to be an NFL offensive lineman, you have um, DJ Fluker, who's going to be an NFL offensive lineman, you have a quarterback who is a superb player in, in, in bloom, so to speak, A.J. McCarron, won a national championship right. as a sophomore. We saw what he did against LSU in that game. Um, you look on the defensive side, you have guys like Damian Square, who's been around now, will be his fifth year. Mm -hmm. uh, Jesse Williams, who Nico no telling Johnson. how good he's going to be. Nico Johnson, C.J. Mosley. Yeah. I mean, then you have a lot of younger guys that we're going to mix well, in. Well, you know, it's like we've talked about before. Not only are the coaches now teaching and mentoring, but the players do it. Because the Absolutely. players that have come through the system know what it takes to win championships. You know, just the way that Ingram passed it down. To Richardson, Richardson passed it down to Lacey. Now Lacey's going to pass it down to D. Hart and Jostin Fowler and others, and it just it just kind of continues to feed off itself. As good as the coaches are, when the players' level of expectation is just as high as the coaches, you got a chance to have a really really good football program. It's it's I, I know we refer back to this, but it's just like the '70s. Yeah. I mean, you remember back in those days, there was Murray Leg and guys in the secondary, and then when they were gone, all of a sudden there was Tommy Wilcox, and it just kept mm -hmm. going down. You know, that's the, it just fed off of, they fed off of each other. And it, it's kind of like that, as you mentioned, Gary, it's, it's, it's just like that now. And then you've got guys coming in that are freshmen that, uh, you know, are outstanding talents that uh, one day they'll continue the tradition. The bottom line is that Alabama now, as you said, it's like the 70s. It's about winning a championship. Anything short of that, and it's not a successful season. But for that to happen, as Nick Saban likes to say, this year's team is not last year's team. And What's on tap for 2012 is for this group of players to zero in, focus, and get better each day with every time that they hit the practice field. I think the big question for everybody is, is how much will you invest in yourself uh, and the team uh, so that we can get better, so that you can get better individually and so that we can get better. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's special to, to be all that you can be. You know, right now, we got too many young guys that are talented guys that need to learn how to do that with more consistency. And let's talk about those young guys. You know, I know Nick Saban loves coaching football. I know he loves preparing for games and uh, preparing for championship games. But I think he likes the spring more than any other time because, as he says, that's the only time that you can focus just on your football team. You're not preparing for a season. You're not preparing for anybody else. And for the most part, that means – an opportunity for the young guys to show what they've got, for coaches to spend more time with them. And you mentioned some of the veteran players, but there are going to have to be some guys that haven't proven themselves step up this year, too. Who are you keeping your eye on? Well, I mean, there's some guys, too, Gary, that are on the fringe. And when I say that, I mean, you know, they've shown some of the things that they can do. A guy like Kevin Norwood, for example. I mean, we all saw what he did in the national championship game against LSU. I mean, he was tremendous. He flashed that great athletic ability that he has. But can he become a guy that can consistently – perform. I mean, you're losing Marquise Mays, you're losing Darius Hanks. Those guys are replaceable. 
But, you know, you've got to have people that step up and do that. You look at DeAndre White, a young receiver, for example, and there's, there are many, Kenny Bell. You know, these are guys that are going to be expected that need to step up on a consistent basis, not a flash here and a flash there, but do it on a consistent basis. And then you look on the defensive right. side. You've got those junior college corners. We've talked about Travell Dixon and Deion Ballou. And, you know, Saban has already singled out Deion Ballou in, in, in his development. So those are the kind of guys that you have to see, you know, start developing consistently. And defensively as well, some of those young linemen, uh, Adrian Hubbard, LaMichael Fanning, D.J. Petway, they're going to get their opportunity to step in and get, uh, get some playing Jeffrey time. Jeffrey Pagan, yeah, Pagan, a guy Hubbard. that's got, you know, tremendous talent. I know that, you know, we all know that Nick Saban's extremely high on Jeffrey Pagan, for example. And, and you know, but again, these are guys that have to become consistent, and uh, they will as they have opportunities. And this spring is a great opportunity for many of those guys to start, you know, developing more. And we still have much more football news coming up. Later, offensive lineman Barry Jones talks about moving to center. He's played them all on the OL. Also, quarterback A.J. McCarron on what it's like to have a new offensive coordinator. But right now, we move to hoops. And the Crimson Tide men had an early exit from the NCAA tournament last week. Trevor Relliford's last second shot did not go through. In fact, uh, well, you could argue he got fouled. But they're not going to call that in that situation. Alabama fell to Creighton 58-57 in a disappointing first game loss. You know, he tried his best to get an attempt up, and, you know, I guess on the way up, he lost the ball, and we couldn't get a clean look at it. Coach drew up a good play, but, you know, they packed it in on the inside, and we was forced to take a jump shot, and um, Trevor just couldn't get it off. We beat Alabama at their own game. I, I would not have guessed that uh, we could win a game at 58-57. Uh, I thought we were going to need to be in the 70s. Uh, and get the tempo in our favor the entire game, um, and we were able never we, we weren't able to ever ever get it there, and that, that's a credit to a great defensive team. And that is what's disappointing is Alabama did hold a team averaging 80 a game into the 50s and, and couldn't win. But Alabama was offensively challenged all year, and we saw that continue in the NCAA tournament. Hey, final possession for Alabama. Creighton had a foul to give. Alabama down one, so they fouled with 4.7 seconds left. Alabama inbounding the ball, expecting, I guess, to face a zone. They saw a man-to-man, -man, so Coach Grant called timeout. That left only 2.4 seconds to get a shot off. You know, Coach Grant's caught some heat for that. And to be honest with you, I've got to agree. I know you want to set the, the play against the defense, but I would have used the timeout with 4.7 seconds to go. To, to run two more seconds off the clock just didn't leave a lot of time and left them in a scramble situation, and you see they got a terrible shot. Yeah, my gut feeling watching it, Gary, was you just have to let them play at that point. Mm -hmm. That seemed to be the thing, if, if there's anything that I'm going to be critical about, was it just seemed like Coach never really let them play. It didn't seem like he had a lot of confidence in their ability offensively to make plays. Again, he knows what's best for his team. They decided they were going to play a defensive-minded brand of basketball, and they were a good defensive team. But they were also a woeful offensive team. And when you consistently have to hold teams down to that low a number, uh, you're going to lose some of those games. You're not going to win them all. And uh, we saw time and time again, they played games where it came down to a final possession or two. Some of those games they won, some of them they didn't. And, uh, you know, I just thought this basketball team had a lot more ability and potential than what actually happened. And with all that said, when you look at the big picture, though, the way this game ended shouldn't have uh, overshadowed how the season went for Alabama. Up next on Tider Insider TV, Coach Anthony Grant will talk about that subject. And we'll look back at the season as a whole. Insider Insider TV will also be taking your phone calls and your emails. There is the information on the screen to get in touch with us. And still to come, as advertised, what does Barrett Jones have to say now that he's the center of attention on the offensive line? You'll find out. Insider Insider TV, the show that takes you inside the Crimson Tide, presented by Buffalo Rock, is coming right back. Really, really proud of uh, the effort our guys gave us. Uh, tonight and over the course of the year. Uh, I think this was a basketball team that grew uh, over the course of the season. And, uh, you know, it was really, really uh, important uh, for this team, I think, in our maturation uh, to get to the NCAA tournament and to try to have some success. You know, today wasn't our day. And the program is headed in the right direction. Alongside Rodney Orr, I'm Gary Harris. Welcome back to Tider Insider TV. I do believe that at the same time, I think, I told you preseason on this program that anything short of the NCAA tournament would have been a big disappointment. So I don't want, and I know there was some adversity, but a lot of teams face adversity. I don't want to, to 
be too optimistic for this team doing what it should have done. This should have been an NCAA tournament team. And to get into the tournament and be one and done, in my opinion, is not a great season. I do think the program's in the right track. At the same time, I think next year there needs to be some strides. Uh, the team doesn't need to even be near the bubble. They need to be in position to get in the NCAA tournament and make a run. I think offensively they've got to improve. I think the brand of basketball should be a little more exciting. You know, that, that was not entertaining basketball to watch at all this season. There were times when it was just downright ugly. And I know winning is the ultimate goal, but at the same time, I think fans want to see a brand of basketball where they get it up and down the floor. That's what we expected when Anthony Grant came in here. Instead, they're playing grinding it out, you know, 60-58 type games. So I think the program's on the right track. At the same time, I think another step needs to be taken next year. Well, you know, you said it wasn't a great year. You know, one, what, what is a great year? What are the standards? I mean, that's something that I think needs to be determined. What, what are the standards? Well, the is it a Sweet 16? Is that the, as far as they... A great year, yeah, is at least the Sweet 16. I mean, uh, truly, the standard should at the University of Alabama should be to win a national championship. That's right. That should be the desire in men's basketball. Making it into the tournament, while you're probably not going to make it every year, that should be a minimal expectation. This should be an NCAA tournament program year in and year out. So the fact that they got back there, that's what I'm saying. That's progress. That's a step in the right direction. But to me, that is not an incredibly successful season but next year hopefully they will build on that got a lot of young players that grew up this year all right up next how is Allen trophy winner Barrett Jones handling being the center of attention on the offensive line plus how is quarterback A.J. McCarron handling a new position coach we'll talk about that and we'll get to your phone calls and emails 205-348-WVUA that's 348-9882 or you can email us TITV at WVUATV.com stay tuned Welcome back to Tider Insider TV for Tuesday, March 20th, and we shift our attention now back to football. Outland Trophy winner Barry Jones has played every position on the offensive line, and this season he is being looked at to replace William Vallejos. Jones says he feels natural filling that role. You know, it's different. Uh, it's challenging, but it's fun. You know, I like, I'm kind of a control freak, so. I guess it's good that I, I get to boss people around now, uh, you know, just telling them what to do and everything. I used to try to boss William around even when I wasn't playing center, so I guess it's good that now I'm actually playing center. Rodney, he was all SEC caliber as a right guard, all American and the Outland Trophy winner as a left tackle, but many have felt for a long time that center is his most natural position. That's scary about how good he might be this year. Uh, I, th I think he's natural at all of it. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing, you know, his versatility on the offensive line. You don't. You rarely find a guy that can do all of those things athletic enough to play left tackle. You know, he can dunk a basketball. I mean, he's, he's, he's incredibly athletic. And to think, to think that before Nick Saban got here, Alabama was not recruiting Barrett Jones. That think about have, that. That would have been a mistake. Yeah. Yeah. But thankfully, Nick Saban came and he's at Alabama and he's still at Alabama going into his fifth season. All right, quarterback A.J. McCarron is making an adjustment, too. He's having to uh, get acclimated to a new offensive coordinator and quarterback's coach, Doug Nussmeyer. We're watching A.J. at practice yesterday. The Tide uh, offensive coordinator, as I said, is also the quarterback's coach. McCarron says, so far, so good. He's a really personal guy. Uh, I know with myself, um, we talk a bunch. Um, I mean, not just while we're here, but outside of uh, being away from the complex. So. Uh, we definitely have a good relationship, um, he, and he's the type of coach to push you on the field, which I like. So uh, hopefully, like I said, hopefully we can just keep progressing as you know uh, a coach and quarterback um, relationship. As we've talked about before, Nussmeyer comes to Alabama after being the offensive coordinator at Washington. Before that, he was at Fresno State. He's a former NFL and Canadian League quarterback uh, and a really bright guy, Ronnie. We've talked about it. It's not going to change too much. There may be some subtle differences, but expect the Alabama offense to be and look a lot like it did under Jim McElwain. Okay, time to take some phone calls. They're lining up for us. Let's go to center and talk with our buddy LD. LD, welcome in. How you doing? Good. Uh, I just wanted to comment on uh, the ball games um, Saturday. Right. And I listened to it on the radio. Right. And the uh, announcers uh, said that they shouldn't have called that timeout with that much time remaining, but he was trying to call a timeout with about four point some odd seconds left on the uh, clock, but he didn't get his timeout until about two and change on the yeah, clock. Yeah, I know, LD, what you're saying, but that, that's what happens. Once you throw the ball in, 
you're not going to get the timeout immediately. I mean, you, you've got to get the officials' attention. The officials got to come over. So once you allow the ball to be thrown in, uh, you're going to lose some time. I don't care if they call it right away. You know, my point is, and I know they were expecting one defense, they got another, but the ball was a dead ball situation after Creighton had fouled for the 16 foul. You could have caught a timeout then with 4.7 seconds and set something up for either defense. I, I thought a timeout should have been used prior to the ball being inbounded, and I do think it cost Alabama. That's just my opinion. Yeah, I mean, I agree with you. It looked down low like Jermichael Green was being held. He too, was being he? held, yeah. but again, that, that was uh, Creighton plays a brand of basketball. Give them credit. They're tough. They're hard-nosed, a little bit handsy. Uh, you know, well, they were they gritty. The hit against, I, I mean, they hurt the kid against North Carolina with yeah. a slap across the wrist. But, uh, again, I thought Relaford got hit, but unless you're mugged in that situation at the end of a game, you're not going to get the call. Let's stay here in Tuscaloosa and talk with Joseph. Joseph, welcome in to TITV. Yeah, Rodney, what's happening with you? Hey, buddy. Hey, say, man. I was going to ask you all this, though, but about Coach Sarah Patterson, a gymnastic teacher. Now, from what I understand, she coached the gymnastic the team to five national championships. I wonder – how come she don't have her statue up there like Saban and Brian Stone? All right, Joseph, we get that question a lot, and, you know, I don't, I don't know the answer. I can tell you this. The precedent was set to have football coaches have statues if they won a national championship here. Uh, there's been no other uh, statues for any other sports here. There may be one coming. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I, you know, but, you know, if Pat Murphy wins a um, championship, we're going to give him a trophy. I mean, give him a statue if a baseball coach wins one or another sport wins one. You know, I mean, right now, football coaches get statues when they win national championships. That's really all I can tell you. I will tell you this. She's in the Alabama Sports Hall of Fame. She has won five national championships. She's got her own practice facility at Coleman Coliseum. She's got the best fan support in the world. I think she's pretty happy. Um, a statue could be coming one day. I mean, you never know at some point. You know, five national championships, Gary, no matter what. That's is, a lot. It's, it's an unbelievable achievement. But, again, football coaches so far are the only coaches – that get uh, trophy, uh, get statues here at the University of Alabama. Okay, let's go to Bessemer and talk with John. John, how are you? Gary, right now, what's going on, man? Hey, buddy. Hey, man, is, uh, I'm trying to find out, is Alabama going to be better this year or huh. what? Uh, not going to be better, John? I, I mean, guess you got to go 14-0. and 0. You know, 14-0, right. and 0. okay. Well, you know, I, I really couldn't answer that question, uh, to be honest with you. It's a little bit early. Uh, you know, you lose a lot of great players. You're talking about Dante Hightower. You're talking about Courtney Upshaw on defense. You're talking about losing two corners and Greg Kirkpatrick and – Dequan Menzies, that's a lot of guys to replace. And of course, they do have people coming back. We've talked about those earlier in the show. But, uh, you know, they have a chance to be a really good football team, you know. But will they be as good as they were last year? Remains to be seen. And remember, I didn't even mention Trent Richardson. Now, I think Eddie Lacy's going to be an outstanding player. But, you know, will he run the football in the situations that Trent ran it like Trent ran it? Well, so as we said for a long time, you know, it's hard to win two in a row. Absolutely. Nobody's won three because it's much easier to get to the top of the mountain than it is to stay there. And it's going to be a challenge for Alabama to try to back up last season with another championship caliber season. But uh, Nick Saban's proven that he can do a lot of amazing things as a head football coach. When you think about it, he's got three national championships in the last seven seasons because two of those right. years he spent in the NFL. Right. Three national championships in his last seven seasons coaching college football in the SEC. That's pretty amazing. Well, more of your phone calls and emails when we come back here to Tighter Insider TV. We're rocking and rolling tonight here on TITV, Rodney, so time's getting away from us. So let's go ahead and get right back to the phones. Uh, Gary's in Fayette County. Gary, what's going on? I'm fine. I just, I just like to ask why Alabama's baseball team don't seem to improve none. Well, it's a good question. Uh, the easy answer is that they're throwing freshman pitcher after freshman pitcher out there. Uh, the problem with that answer is the pitching's actually been decent. The hitting for a veteran team has been anemic. The top hitter on the team is a freshman, Ben Moore, the catcher. Um, they're struggling. And, you know, Friday night they had a chance to get one at Arkansas. They let that one get away from them in extra innings and then got clocked on Saturday and Sunday. They're at Troy tonight. Uh, the, you know, they're going to have to try to find some answers. It looks like it's going to be a long year. But remember this about baseball, Gary. There are a lot of games. Teams can get hot. And if they can just somehow get into the SEC tournament, they may have a shot. Yeah, you hope so. right He's now. done some things late in the season. Yeah, His every year. Mitch, Mitch has done that. So. And they're going to need to get better in a hurry this year because you're right, it's not, it's not looking very promising. When you're not scoring any runs, you put a lot of pressure on your pitching staff, and then you've got a young pitching staff that doesn't always hold up, and the result is uh, they're four games under 500 right now. All right, let's stick here in Tuscaloosa and talk to Denise. Denise, how are you? I'm doing well. Thanks. How are you, gentlemen? Doing great. That's great. I was just curious, you know, I, I was born and raised here. I have um, participated in a lot of sports activities as a as a uh, onlooker fan, Alabama fan. Uh, all the hoopla always seems to 
to be focused on Alabama football. However, you know, at one time we had a big, big fan base for Alabama basketball. Are we ever going to get back to the point of the the parquet and plaid days with Wimp Sanderson? It was a it was a wonderful time it in was, my life. It was a great time, Denise, and, and you're right. Alabama does have a good fan base, and they've got a loyal fan base, and, and they've got some fans that are incredibly excited about basketball. And when that team plays well and wins on a consistent basis, and this year I thought the crowds were good considering the team struggled at times. When they win big, the fans will be out there, I promise you. And I think it's coming. I do think Anthony Grant's going to get it done. Hey, we're back after this. Thanks for the phone call. Finally, the Alabama gymnastics team will look to defend their SEC championship this weekend. The Tide wrapped up the regular season beating North Carolina on Friday. They're currently third in the nation. They'll head to Duluth, Georgia for the SEC championship on Saturday. If we are lights out and we knock down our performances, I feel like, you know, if there's a better team out there that can beat us, so be it. But I want to be the best that we can be because I think that's what we have a great quality in us. As we check in on Alabama softball, they're doing what Alabama softball does. 25-0, and 0, ranked number one, hosts Tennessee in a doubleheader tomorrow than a tournament this weekend. Alabama baseball, as we mentioned, got swept at Arkansas over the weekend. They're at Troy tonight, and uh, they're trying to get it going. Hey, that's going to do it for tonight's program. It's dinner time. About 7.15 or so, we'll be pulling in over there at Buddy's Rib and Steak in Northport. Yum, yum, all I can say. Why don't you join us over there for some dinner? For Rodney Orr, for our producer, John Huddleston, our director, Jonathan Newman, and our entire TITV staff, I'm Gary Harris. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again next week. Roll Tide, everybody.